Hi, welcome. Wow, this room was empty just a couple of minutes ago. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and uh, listen to my talk. Last year, I went to New York and we visited Madame Tussaud. And they have this really cool VR thing. You can become a Ghostbuster. Being a nerd, of course, we had to try. So we get teamed up and we get sent into this room where we get geared up as well. So we get the, the proton packs and we get the helmets, which, of course, is the VR headset. And we even get the guns and everything. And we can see each other in the virtual world as we go in. And of course, there's a ghost problem, being a Ghostbuster. So, so we get sent into an apartment complex in New York. And New York, they have kind of tall buildings. And I will come back to why that is important. We, uh, we go in and we, have, we can open physical doors in the virtual world. Really, really cool. And we get to ride on an elevator. And you can really feel the vibrations in the floor. So it really feels like we're going on an elevator, which we obviously aren't. And at one time, I'm not that good of a shooter, so at one time I missed a ghost, and it flies right through me, and I can feel it in my whole body, kind of like, eesh. And we come up, and we go out of the elevator, and we're really high up, <laughs> and the whole front of the building is teared away. And I'm, let's say, a tiny, tiny bit afraid of heights. Let's call it that. And we hear this voice from our command center that we need to go over to the adjacent building using this fire escape plank thingy. I mean, it had handle, and, and it was like this wide. And I was, I'm, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This isn't real. This isn't real. And then I feel it wobble and creak. I'm like, screw this. And I got over to the other side by cheating. But there was also a downside to all of this, besides from the height, obviously. One, one of the team members, when I looked over to her, she had her gun going through her stomach. Didn't feel like that was a comfortable fit thing. And one of our other teammates, well, when she was going to go through a doorway, she was actually walking through the wall. She was not a ghost. That shouldn't be happening. And then sometimes it was lagging a bit and a little bit glitchy, and, and, and the avatars were walking like this all of a sudden, like they're, I don't know, were possessed. Maybe they were, I don't know. And don't get me wrong, the material they had is fantastic. So if you get the chance to try it, you should really. I really encourage you to try it. But my point is, and, and this is where this talk started, actually. My point is, if they have only did, done like a couple of tweaks, this would have been a perfect experience. And we are living in such exciting times. We have new technologies popping left and right today. Basically, a new console every week. But that also means we have hot, new, cool ways we can interact with our solutions that we write. Which means that UX will be so much more important, because if you're a little bit off in this space, people will get nauseous. And that's not a good experience. So I will go through the differences in AR, MR, and VR. I mean, we have a lot of realities out there. We will scratch the surface of where we can go wrong, how to fix it. And I will give you a few pointers you could keep in mind when you are going into this space. Though many things may actually vary from platform to platform, if, if you look like AR and VR, I think we can still learn from all of the platforms and have that in our, um, our solutions, depending on, no depending on what platform we are using. My name is Jessica Engstrom. I'm a Windows development MVP. I run a company with my husband, who is right down here, <laughs> where we um, focus on future tech like uh, bots and, and uh, HoloLens and UX, because that will become so much more important. So that's why we categorize, I categorize that as a future tech as well. 
We also run uh, or we have a podcast with that name called Coding After Work, which is also a user group. If you're into that sort of thing, this is where to go. But this is not why you're here, is it? To hear me talk about me. There are a lot of types of realities out there, and basically all the different companies try to tweak them and come up with new realities, and what are really the differences in these? Uh, both virtual reality and augmented reality has actually been around for quite a while, longer than we think, usually. Back in, let's see, 1584, there was a scientist who wrote, how we may see in a chamber things that are not. So how we may see in a chamber things that are not. He even had a drawing and everything. And this is the first known description of a technique called Pepper's Ghost Effect. Now, Pepper's Ghost Effect is an illusion trick used in theaters and, and the amusement parks and um, basically displays in shop everywhere nowadays. And it's been around since 1862. Think about that for a minute. We had augmented reality 20 years before we got the first car. Kind of interesting. If we skip ahead 100 years, we land in the early 1960s and we get the earliest multimodal immersive machine. Isn't that a nice name? It was called Sensorama. And I think Noah showed this on the keynote um, yesterday, right? Yeah. So this is a really cool machine. It's a mechanical device, and you can sit down, and it has tilting, body tilting, in the early 60s. It has aromas you can trigger, and it has a vibration and a stereoscopic, really wide angle 3D, and uh, a lot of other cool stuff. In the late 60s, we have Ivan Sutherland, who um, created what is widely considered to be the first AR, VR, head-mounted display contraption, really. I mean, look at it. It was called the Sword of Damocles. Don't you love that name? I do. Probably my favorite name. Sounds like something out of Zelda or another game like that. In the 90s, we got virtuality, these really large... VR machines you could find in, in uh, amusement parks or, or um, arcades and things like that. 2013, we get Google Glasses, which was a little ahead of their time. But now things are really speeding up and we get HTC Vive, we get the Meta One, we get HoloLens, and we get <laughs> Oculus Rift, we get everything. And one really fun, I don't know, interesting fact is that the Meta Glasses this one, is basically using Pepper's Ghost technique that we described in the 1500s. I think that is, that is amazing. So, what is the differences in all of these realities? Well, we have something going on with the clicker, and we have augmented reality as well. And how many of you guys have tried Pokemon Go? Yeah, basically 90% of you. It has come and gone augmented reality a few times, but when Pokemon Go came, it kind of became mainstream. So nowadays, every kid knows what augmented reality is. Even my mother knows what it is. So augmented reality is when you overlay the real world with digital stuff or augment the real world. Usually you do so with a screen, so you see the real world and the digital stuff through a screen like a phone or an iPad or whatever it is. Of course, there are more advanced augmented reality units, like the Dacry. Yeah, the Dacry Smart Helmet, I think it is uh, around 130,000 Swedish kroner or something like that. And this is aimed more towards industrial use, so that's why we don't see it that much. Unless you're into architecture and stuff like that. Virtual reality is when you immerse yourself into the digital world. I mentioned the 90s arcade earlier. This is what it looked like. And you see, this is really dangerous stuff because he's in this plastic barrel of sorts. And I don't know if you see it, but he's trapped, strapped in as well. 
he has a safety belt. This is how dangerous it was back then. <laughs> I love that picture because the woman is pointing like he's going to see that in the virtual world. <laughs> I love it. This is what it looks like today. So look at the left side. This is where the real world and, and this is what he is seeing. And he's so immersed, so he's convinced there's actually a table. So maybe being strapped in wasn't such a bad idea after all. They had it down there. Now, this is something Intel started talking about a while back called merged reality. And it is basically VR with elements of the real world. So in this case, you can see your own hands. Now, I'm not really sure that this name, merged reality, is going to stick. And you will see why when we talk about mixed reality. And this is mixed reality. One of the mixed realities. You can't just have one. So this is when you mix the virtual world with the real world. Virtual objects can interact with the physical world. Like it can actually bounce up off of your table or, or uh, floor or what have you. We have um, HoloLens, which this is uh, showing. We have uh, the Meta, we have Tango phones, and we also have AR Kit and AR Core. And all of those are, per definition, mixed reality. Even if it's also augmented reality, it, it's a mess. But mixed reality is basically everything you mix with the real world and the digital world. Microsoft is also collaborating with a lot of headset manufacturers, like VR headset manufacturers, as I say. And they are bringing the inside-out tracking that HoloLens is using to these cheaper virtual reality headset, which means that we don't need any more cameras or, or lasers to track us. And this is also called mixed reality because they are using the real world to track where you are which means no more bumping into walls or tripping over the cat or something like that. So that is really good news. So really you could, because there's cameras on these things, you could technically actually do exactly what Intel is doing with Emerge Reality and lift in your hands or what have you in the, the, the actual uh, digital world, which is why I don't think Emerge Reality will be a thing rather than Mixed Reality. Clear? Awesome. So now that we know what all the differences in these realities are, it's time to get to work and start to identify the experience. And here you need to think long and hard on what kind of experience you are designing, because this actually has really big impact. I tried the NASA's Destination Mars on the HoloLens uh, a couple of years ago. And you go into a room with, I think we were like eight or 10 people. And it's a little, little specialty built room with black walls, black floor, black ceilings, and some orange or white uh, squiggly lines just so that HoloLens could keep track of where it is and where you are. But they have real data from the Mars Orbiter and the uh, Mars Rover that they are using. So they have built up a piece of Mars that you can walk on. And Buzz Aldrin is there, virtually of course, and telling you about stuff and you can go around, oh look, there's a crack here, I wonder why that is, and you can click it and they will tell you why. But you are fully immersed in this world. They have well, you see here, you, the only thing you see is Mars. So they have not taken advantage of the HoloLens as a platform. They're not using my walls and my floor and my ceilings, my, my tables and stuff like that. They are just doing a VR world for a HoloLens. So that's what I mean when you should really think long and hard on what kind of experience you want to do. Do you want to build a whole world or is it just to augment some stuff and, and have like the, the stones or whatever from the rocks from, from Mars? So that's one thing. And being that it's popping up so many new devices all the time right, right now, we are going to need to also identify the type of tech 
we are going to run on. Because it's a big difference if you're running this on an HTC Vive or on your phone or on a HoloLens and so on. Because there isn't one VR experience anymore and there's certainly not one AR experience. So think about where you want to be, what tech is going to be used, and uh, well, in the 2D world of things, we can design and, and develop one app with one design and basically put it out on every single platform with little or no harm, but we can't do that in this space. Because actually, they can become cyber sick if you're not really careful, and that's not good. So, we know the tech, now we need to figure out the play area, or the area you have to work with if it's not a game. There are a few different types of areas to work with and the experience differs a bit. So first up is the stationary or almost stationary where the users either sit by the desk or in the couch and not moving a muscle or well they can stand up but the point is they're not moving around. And then we have location based uh, room scale, which is basically what uh, they did with the um, Ghostbusters thing. But you can also be like in um, museums, so you can go and, and actually see the castles they had back when. And if there's a, a physical chair, you can overlay it with a throne or something like that. So when you sit down, you, you feel like uh, royalty, but really it's a cheap IKEA chair. So things like that. We also have the more common room scale, and this is where the user can walk around freely within the tract area. And you have probably seen J-Way, they have a HTC Vive here, and they have white tape on the floor, and that is the tract area. Um, it also differs between the different types of VR solutions here. Uh, the HTC Vive is around 15 by 15 feet, and the Oculus Rift has less depending on how many cameras you add on to it. So that's a, that's a whole mess as well we need to think about. We also need to think about tethered devices because many of these are tethered. Even some of the AR and MR headsets are tethered. So we don't want the, want the user make them run like two meters when the cord is one and a half because that would probably yank down the computer, which is something I would totally do. So we use HoloLens. <laughs> so actually HoloLens and Daiquiri uh, have uh, no cables at all. So you are a little bit more freely and you don't have to have a tracked area. So there's um, not, not much to think about there in that aspect. Now the HoloLens is using something called world scale. And it has built-in sensors, and in this case, it's uh, environmental sensing cameras here on, on, uh, on the headset, which is constantly scanning the room for where, where the table is, where you are, where, where the holograms is, where your walls are, and so on, because it needs to track where you are so it can be really, really solid. So now we know the play area. How does the user move in this area we just defined. Well, we have a gamepad. That's a classical way it works on basically every or almost every platform. We have teleportation. And this is a common way to move longer distances in, in uh, games and, and solutions, like uh, the lab, for instance. They have, um, you hold your controller and it will project um, a beam. And where you, when you click that, you will actually teleport to where that beam is. And uh, the same thing goes for, this is Batman Arkham VR. They have a predefined area, so you're not as free as in the HTC Vive, but you have a little um, symbol with a bat and, and, and the controller that you can go to uh, or teleport to. Both of these are really easy to use, but in my experience, the um, HTC Vive teleporting, where you, where you have a little bit more leeway or precision, is a little harder to get used to in the beginning uh, if it's a completely new person playing the game than this is. But both are fairly easy, so there's that. 
We also have physical movements when the user move around freely. Um, but here it could also be a good idea to think about shortening the walking distance, the actual walking distance, um, so you don't have them walk like 200 miles to get to the next village, which is the next level, which will be kind of tiresome. Unless that is part of the plot, of course. Actually, you could implement more than one of these to give them uh, some, some, <laughs> some choices if, if you uh, have the time and, and money for it. So now we know how to move and it's time to look how we interact with the world. With all these new mediums, we have new ways of interacting with them, both human interaction and new types of controllers. They're necessarily not super new, but compared to our uh, 2D world of things, uh, like 30 years of navigating there, it's fairly new. So we have uh, the most familiar ones. We have gamepads again and, and the specialty controllers. It's one is for HoloLens and HTC Vive and the Oculus. We have some, um, well, some of these devices, kind of most of these devices are Bluetooth enabled. And that means we can actually use our mouse and keyboard. Now, if you're doing a fully immersive VR thing, that might not be the best idea because they cannot see what they're typing, but it's still an option for some solutions. For devices that has hand tracking, you can use gestures like the HoloLens and Intel and a few more. And you use these predefined gestures so you don't have to handle that yourself, but they're still a word of caution when it comes to that. Some games are implementing their own versions, like really cool stuff, like uh, the Superman flight, you stand like this and you fly. And that is really cool, but standing for, like this for four hours, not that fun anymore. So you need to think about that before you implement uh, such things. And I've been demoing the HoloLens for, since it came out, like what, one and a half years ago or something. And for probably 3,200 people or something like that. And I have seen it all. It's a fairly easy gesture. You hold your finger up, you pinch them together and you raise it again, right? Doesn't feel difficult to me, that is. Because I'm used to it. But we have seen the Angry Duck. We have seen Pac-Man. We have seen move every single finger <laughs> but the one I'm telling you to move. We've seen the worm. So my point here is what's obvious for you or me might not be obvious to the user. And I'm not saying to not use these cool features. Imagine using the force in VR or something like that. That's super cool. But use it sparsely. That will also give you a much more, well, cooler impact if, if it's only sometimes and you don't have to stand like this for two hours. Gaze is something, well, it's basically where you look. Unless it's not eye tracking, then it's where you have your head pointed at. So you basically have a line between your eyes going out like that or from your nose or whatever, like this. It's a good idea not to execute on every single move. That will become jittery quite fast. Granted, most of these uh, platforms will actually provide you with a gaze handler. But if you are going to use it and handle it yourself, uh, you need to know that if you put something on a per person's head, their head is not still, even when they think it's still. It will be a little bit like that. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but the image will look like that. And also, if, if you're just looking through the world and there happens to be menu items all, of, all over the place, it will pop like crazy if you execute on every single one. Here we go. Voice is another way of interacting. And this will be so much easier for people to use because saying, take a picture, instead of actually navigating through either hand controller or hand gestures to get to that, it's so much easier. We actually, I, I think Jimmy talked about this in his uh, bot session today, but we, we type around average 40 
words per minute, but we speak on average 150 words per minute, which means we are really good at speaking. Um, unless you're, what is it, 400 words per minute if you're an auctioneer? That is impressive. And this is also why Cortana and Siri and Alexa and things like that are getting really popular and, and more devices are getting voice integrated. So this is something you really should utilize and, and think about that. Of course, when it comes to that, we also need to handle the language design, but that's a whole other presentation. So um, if you're into that, look it up because it's really important. So now we know how to interact with the world, but how does the world interact with the user? So being that we are in such immersive worlds, even if it's AR, MR, whatever, uh, we have to catch their attention, the user's attention, and we have to work a little harder to actually get their attention because they are looking at all your, your cool stuff you made in this world, right? And we also don't have the set frames to anchor our content, like a web page where we just stick every single menu item we have to the left and things like that. All of a sudden, our canvas is 360 degrees, right? We don't know which way they're going to look. We could just anchor the items to the camera. So wherever they're looking, they have the menus, kind of like a web page that follows you around. But be careful of putting things up in people's faces because this is not nice. And also it can actually um, hide other things and, or obstruct other things in your solution when you have menu items in front of you. And also they can actually get cyber sick if they have too much things going on in, um, up close in your face. So we don't want to put all the information on screen at all times. Uh, it will get cluttered quite quickly. So unless you are designing for Iron Man or the actual things you have doesn't need to be on screen at all times, use contextual menus. That is so much more nicer for, for the users. But also be careful with that. I sound so negative, don't I? <laughs> But be careful of that as well, because, again, if we go back to the destination Mars, and this is something they did really, really good, contextual menu. So if I'm over here and I'm looking at a rock or something and I want to know more about it, I get up a menu and I click something, I get up a contextual menu that just sits right over the stone. But I've also seen really, really beautiful solutions where, where they have this really... I don't know, can you call it sexy? Like swooshes out over whatever you're looking at, swooshes out and there's like orbs glowing and really, really nice. But the problem is my, my, my rock is here and my menu item is over here. So I'm actually losing the context. And that's not, a, that's not really a contextual menu anymore. So you, it's really important to think about the um, relationship between the nested contextual uh, menu items and, and stuff like that. If you have information or labels that needs to describe something in the 3D world, put them on the same z-axis, even if that feels a little wrong, it, it will at sometimes do, but put them on the same z-axis uh, because that will make more sense to the user when they are actually in the world. Okay, so how do we get the user's attention then? Well, there are a couple of tricks out there. One of them is visual cues, and that's a, that's a good thing. It can be like a glowing thing or a pulsating aura around it. But make sure that you don't do it just once and then nothing. Because if they were looking over here while you were blinking, they won't see it. So that's a, that's a thing to think about as well. And with all these realities, we also need to apply some spatial thinking. We have completely different canvas than we're used to when we're doing the 2D world, right? So this will be, there is one thing that will be uh, so much more different, difficult, no, it will be so much more, um, I am losing my words, important, it will be so much more important than ever, and that is audio. That was a hard word for me. So if you have multiple objects in your solution that can make 
no noises or sounds, put the actual audio controller on the different items because it will make such big difference for the user. If they turn around, they will actually feel like they are in the 360 world. So this is also some way, a way you can uh, grab their attention. Now, many of these devices use gaze instead of controllers or also controllers, but gaze. And another thing that will help us get a more physical sense about thing is um, a phrase I first heard uh, John Howard use, and it's haptic audio. And it sounds crazy because you can't really touch audio, right? But if you give the surfaces and the objects lifelike sound, the user will almost feel like they can touch it. Are they running on, on snow or, or grass? Are, are the items hollow or, or not? And this can also make them understand what they can act on or not, or can they lift this or things like that. So that is, um, that is a good thing to keep in mind. And we have learned for, for a couple of years now that in the 2D world, we should be uh, genuinely digital. We, we shouldn't use skeuomorphism, we shouldn't imitate the real world. But in the 3D world of things, that is exactly what we should do. And Unity, uh, which is one way of, of developing for these platforms, it does help you a lot with uh, audio when it comes to 3D audio. And uh, I know for HoloLens, for instance, you get all the help uh, with, um, with the 3D spatial sound. Uh, HoloLens has, um, has uh, what, what is it called? HRTF, Head Related Transfer Function uh, Speakers, which is super nice if you actually do the 3D uh, sound on them. Same thing goes for audio cues as to visual cues. Uh, make the user know that something is about to happen, but don't do it just once. Uh, really um, good practice is use the steps of three. So like something is about to happen any second now, and now it's happening. That's a really good way to, to get their attention. Sometimes, VR is, as a joke, called vomit reality. I don't know. How many of you have ever felt nauseous or gotten a headache or something like that from VR? Yeah, that's a lot of you. Yeah, I, <laughs> I feel with you. And, and this makes UI and, and how we handle UX really, really important, because if you're a little bit wrong, this will happen. And the fact is that we haven't cracked what is truly motion sickness, what causes motion sickness. We have theories and we have some solutions and some workarounds, but it's still a fairly new medium. And we are actually, both the tech and UX research are going on as we speak. So we are making this up as we go and try to better ourselves. But there are three prominent theories of what causes cyber sickness. And the first one is poison theory. And this is based on the theory that when we have hallucinations, which VR and AR actually can feel like, our body goes into survival mode and, and wants to eject whatever mushroom is left in our stomachs. And then we have postural instability. And this theory is based on that the main goal for a human body is to remain a postural stability. And in VR, if you have a prolonged postural instability, like uh, when, you, when you are turning or accelerating or quick changes in the environment, VR uh, is said to give postural instability and therefore also cyber sickness. The third theory is sensory conflict theory. And this is based, of, uh, based on the conflict of two key sensory systems, the visual and the vestibular system. And they provide information about a person's orientation and per perceived motion. So the vestibular, vestibular system says that I'm stationary because I'm sitting down, but my, um, my other sensor, the visual system, says that I'm moving because it sees that I'm moving, right? And hence this. So we have to work around that uh, a bit. There we go. 
What we do know about cyber sickness, there's, th there's things we do know. We do know that there are a lot of individual factors. Maybe not such a good, <laughs> good uh, information, but there are. And some of them are like ages. If you're between the age 2 and 12, you have the greatest susceptibility of cyber sickness. And when they grow older, it will actually decrease uh, really rapidly. Women has a wider field of view, which makes us more perceptive to flicker and therefore also cyber sickness. And there's actually research going on that uh, shows that female hormones can also affect the susceptibility. Yay. Underlying illnesses and being hungover, I'm sorry, this can also make you uh, more prone to cyber sickness. Even your posture, if you're sitting or you're standing up, can have an impact on, on uh, these things. Things like latency and flicker it, it can induce cyber sickness. And this is why it's so important to actually test your solution on the actual tech you are going to use or the end user is going to use. And like Noah said yesterday, if, you're, if you have a latency of uh, over 20 milliseconds, cyber sickness will kick in or may kick in, I should say. So this is why this is super important to test on the same tech. How are the user moving around? Are, are they on a train or a car or things like that? Um, sure. We could save it and have all the content come to the user and have them stationary the whole game, but what's the fun in that, right? And also, that won't help for everybody. So if you have the time and budget for it, you should implement more than one way of navigation to actually work around this so that people can uh, change to the ones they are actually comfortable with. Free roaming in games are fantastic because it makes you want to go around and explore these fantastic worlds you have made for the user, but some people will get sick. That's how it is. And one thing you can do to try to fix that is to give them a virtual body. It helps a lot if it's done right. If you have a body that doesn't respond, uh, correspond with the user, it can actually make things things a lot worse, like in the woman who had her gun going through her stomach, not good. Or if they make you taller or, or shorter or render you a little bit under the floor and things like that, that is not a good uh, feeling. Even worse, if, if you force the user um, into the motions, like you are making the avatar move, but the user isn't, that is really not good. Some people actually prefer a third-person view in VR and, and these kind of things to not get sick. But also, if you put them on a vehicle as, or something that moves like that, you can, um, you can show the road so they actually can see. It actually helps in real world as well. A friend of mine, he's a game developer, he's called Max. He is behind... Um, a game called Archery on HTC Vive. And they were, they were, one time in their game, they were on a moving truck, and the feedback they got was that it was super sickening, <laughs> the game. So what they had to end up doing was lock the rotation of the tracking space. So basically like one of those according buses, and that helped a lot. So that's a, that's a good tip as well. Another trick is to show the road, as I told you before, because this actually works in real life. I, I, I can get car sick, but not if I actually see the road. And also, if you don't have to drive, you can actually use um, Blink or, or um, transportations like we talked um, about before. If the journey isn't part of the game, of course. Since there are so many individual factors and this can affect your experience, um, we are actually taking away a lot of the interfaces we're used to from, from the computer screen. And we need to work a little bit more uh, on user research and testing. And you should never, ever, ever 
skip testing when it comes to uh, AR and MR, and especially not VR. This is, preferably you should do this really early, almost time, and you should do it often. And also with the actual target audience and, and on the tech you are going to release on, because if you are trying it on in your monster machine, hmm, things can go wonky. There are a couple of tips that uh, we could use to make things a little bit easier for, for the user. And uh, because some of these users will be fairly new to this space. So ease them into VR. Don't just put them smack in the middle of a really immersive world. Solutions like um, the Oculus Rift waiting area is really good where, where the user has to click a button to actually get into the actual um, game is really good. Also tutorials and how-tos, and this will, this will help them a lot, but also make sure you can go back to this if they have a friend who's trying it on at their, their place. If you're on an elevator ride or a balloon flight and things like that, uh, it's a good idea to have a still focal point in, um, in, so that they can actually focus on while they are, are, um, they are going on the ride. This will also help with cyber sickness as well. If the user is close to a wall or a chair and things like that, it's good to warn them. Now, often, we, or in most cases, we actually get help with this. But if you are handling those things yourself, you need to make sure that the user can trust that you won't make them run into the wall or something like that, because that will also make them relax and enjoy your game or application even more. In mixed reality, field of view is sometimes a bit small like this. And to counteract that, you can make these items smaller or put them further back into the world. And also, your brain is fantastic. So if you, um, if you use like the HoloLens, which has a kind of narrow field of view, you automatically take a step back if, if the hologram is too large and things like that. And also, the 3D sound will make you believe that you have a 360 uh, canvas when you actually only have like a printer page like that. Smoothing is also something is, that is going to help you a lot. Um, if you're handling the gaze or the cursor yourself, you need to add smoothing because otherwise it will go jumpy like this and, and that's not a good experience as well. And don't pull the cord so to speak, just so they can get out of VR. Fade to black instead, because that will make the users feel so much better. So to sum things up, think about, well, identify the experience and the tech and the play area, and uh, make it as comfortable as you can for the user so they don't get sick. And if there is one thing and only one thing that you will take with you from this, it's testing, because this is super important. You can't tick every single box, but if you test it enough, you can come pretty darn close. So where are these techniques heading? What's the future? Well, let me tell you a possible uh, game in the future. So I'm in my living room, and I'm uh, going to relax with a... Uh, Nice little horror game, because that is so relaxing, right? So I fire up my VR system by voice, of course, because that's easier. And I find myself in a field of grass. And I can smell the actual grass. I can feel the wind in my hair. And I see a weeping angel. And the game is so smart, it can actually measure if my palms is getting clammy, it can measure if my voice is breaking, is my, if my heart is racing and things like that. So it can actually adapt the level of scariness, I guess, to me. So this means that for once, me and my friend can have the exact same scary, uh, well, amount of scary game, even if I'm a scaredy cat and she's not. So if I blink or close my eyes, the game can adapt. And I get the weeping angel spit as she hisses and comes onto me like that. Imagine that creature looking you in the eye every move you make. No. Yeah, I'm the scaredy cat. 
But also, if she's catching me, if she actually catches me, I will feel it in my body. My friends, this isn't the future. This is now. We have the technology to do this today. So I encourage you, go out there, choose a platform and make awesome experiences. Thank you.